Welcome to the Western Bell podcast series with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled Fourth Way Magic, How Hermetic and Indigenous Traditions Interface with the Gurdjieff Work. The talk was given by Rob Schmidt and Stuart Goodnick on July 9th, 2022, via Zoom. Rob and Stuart are the spiritual directors of the Tayu Meditation Center. They have hosted 400 episodes of The Mystical Positivist, a radio show which broadcasts conversations with practitioners of different spiritual traditions. They are students of the spiritual teacher Robert Daniel Ennis, who died in 1998. In this talk, Rob and Stewart discuss their foundational practice in the fourth way and their exploration of the West African Dagara tradition. They reference their bookstore in Sebastopol, California, Many Rivers Books and Tea, and their past involvement in organizing the Conscious Family Festival. If there is benefit in this talk for you, please consider sharing the link to it or writing a review on social media or on one of the podcast platforms. Rob Schmidt speaks first, then Stuart Goodnick. So I was the one who came up with the talk idea, so I think I'll start off. I thought I came up with it. <laughs> you always do. <laughs> That's because we're so in tune with each other. Yeah, his, his thoughts are my thoughts, but actually it's the other way around. The fourth way, our teacher certainly had an introduction to it, but not from the standard lineage. His was a very different lineage through E.J. Gold and other teachers as well. And we didn't do things quite the way many of the folks in the fourth way do. And over time, we've become more and more acquainted with the differences from other fourth way lineages. We now uh, actually participate in a weekly Zoom meeting with folks on the fringe. Yeah, I think there, there are legitimate lineage holders from people who are students of Gurdjieff. Right. It's just that they are lineages that circumvented, for the most part, not entirely, the Gurdjieff <clears throat> Foundation. Right. And a lot of people hear about the fourth way and it has a reputation for being rigid and doctrinaire, frankly. And for some of those lineages within the fourth way, that's absolutely true in my experience. But nevertheless, our background is quite deeply founded in some of the basic fourth way practices. And our teacher also elaborated some other materials as well along the way. But over the last few years, since Robert Ennis's passing, in the late 90s, we've begun to explore and add to both our own personal practices as well as that which we are exploring on behalf of the folks we work with as well. And some of those practices include things that are really quite differently founded than the fourth way. And that's part of what we're going to talk about tonight. But the question to me is, how do we integrate these things? How do we bring them together in a meaningful and useful way, respectful to all the sources, and not beholden to a rigid idea about things that need not be held rigidly? So that's the, the basic premise of the evening. I want to back up a little bit in case not everyone in the audience is familiar with terms like the fourth way. So just to give some context on what we're talking about, the fourth way is a Western spiritual tradition that was founded by a unusual, very enigmatic mystic of Greek and Armenian origin. His name was George Gurdjieff. He's mysterious enough, even though he was in the public face in the latter part of his life, that there's arguments about his birth date. Some say 1866, some say 1877. But he was born in that sort of 
middle Asian area of uh, Armenia, Turkey, Greece. He was in that mixture of ethnicities and in the sphere of the Russian Empire. And he was a seeker. He had many influences that he writes about in books that you can take literally, but probably should take allegorically. Even his personal history is not completely clear. But what he did that's most interesting is he traveled throughout Asia. He partook of a number of different spiritual traditions. I think the best sources we know is that he probably had his deepest training in some esoteric Sufi schools, potentially in the Afghan area. But uh, again, this is conjecture. But what he did that we do know about was he came back to the West, starting in Russia, and he opened up a spiritual tradition that was completely unique in terms of language, methodology, approach. And he began teaching in Russia right before the Russian Revolution. And what he unpacked was a teaching that was kind of tuned more for a modern mindset, a mindset that was steeped in scientism, knew about atoms, knew about astronomy and things like that. And so it had a, on the surface, a kind of intellectual veneer which is partly why it gets his reputation for being somewhat of an intellectual tradition. But the ideas that he brought are ideas that you can recognize in a lot of different spiritual traditions. And the technology or the practices and the emphasis, I think, were unique and critical and still relevant today. So we're not going to go into the full history of Gurdjieff's arc beyond just saying that he made his way from Russia because of the revolution Ultimately, I think through Turkey, and he ended up in France, and he founded a school in France and traveled throughout Europe and into the U.S. and seeded this teaching. And ultimately, with his death in 1950, there were a number of people who had been strongly influenced by him who continued work groups and teaching lineages in the form of group activities and sitting groups and the like. And then a foundation we were talking about called the Gurdjieff Foundation um, has been, in a sense, the holder of the copyrights of the materials that he left behind and fancy themselves in many respects as the uh, holders of the legacy. And in some respects, that may be true. And in other respects, not at all. There's lots of legacies that are out there. Unusual about the fourth way is because it is partly an oral tradition and partly lots of writings about the fourth way, it's still largely taught word of mouth in the form of groups and private activities. And so you won't find fourth way people evangelizing. And sometimes it's hard to find groups. And when you find the groups, they're not, you know, opening the door and trying to get your registration fees. They're usually closing the door if you arrive a minute late and basically holding a pretty strict protocol about how you enter into that space. And so in that sense, again, gets this reputation for a certain kind of austerity. And in the spiritual circles, there's a old joke about how do you tell, you know, a a party of a big spiritual gathering who the fourth wave people are. It's the people who are standing in the uh, corner uh, frowning, not having a good time. That's the reputation. The reality, though, if you read the literature and you read some of the stories about Gurdjieff is that he was a human being who lived large. He had an amazing presence. He touched a lot of people, even people who normally would want to stay far away from him, but he really touched people because of the strength of his presence and the strength of his intention. And he was also a hugely generous human being. In his later years, he'd be known to be like giving candy to children on the streets or taking some of the accumulated skills he had in spiritual healing and applying them to poor people who just needed some help to get by. So he's multidimensional and a enigmatic figure, bigger than many of the people who came after him, and yet some very impressive people followed in his footsteps. So... That's in a nutshell what the fourth way is about. And to echo what Rob was saying, our tradition didn't derive directly from a lineage holder, you know, in the sense of someone who's teacher or studied directly with Gurdjieff. Our teacher, Robert Innes, studied with kind of a shape-shifting guy named B.J. Gold, who's very creative at shape-shifting into a tradition and living that tradition fully and vitally and then shape-shifting into another tradition. And yet, even with EJ's community, the language of the fourth way and the precision of that language was something that 
he kept using and our teacher Robert used it. It's the language in which we would formulate how we think about what we're doing in spiritual work. So that was our education, Stuart's and my education. And I am still one of those folks who is convinced that we need to be grounded in one tradition before it's going to be advantageous to look at what others have to offer. In other words, the spiritual smorgasbord is not for me. And I don't think it works works in the sense that real transformation is supported when we hop to and fro from traditions. And yet tonight's topic is about how we have been exploring some of these other traditions. We were having a conversation actually about this with these fourth way friends this morning, in fact, uh, the ones I told you about. And at least one of those other folks, well, actually a couple, have also had some experience in exploring various indigenous traditions. And one of the points that our friend made was that in order to be able to use and employ those other traditions faithfully and with utility, one has to be passive to that tradition. Now, that's referring to the fourth way language of active, passive, and harmonizing, the three forces. That's fourth way language. But what that means in practice is that one has to begin from a place of acceptance. What you're being taught when you enter into these other traditions may appear at first to be entirely unrelated to what you've been taught to think of as spiritual practice. And goodness knows, I've had to let go of ideas about and judgments about spiritual traditions as we've explored these various indigenous ways. There are two particular ones that we've become acquainted with. One is through our friend who's a Northern California Pomo Indian, and another a friend who's a lineage holder actually in a couple of traditions, but primarily this West African Dagara tradition. And being passive to what you are being presented with, it seems obvious, it seems straightforward. But the point I want to start off with here is that it means that the process of self-examination has yet another topic, another area to explore. Because we grow up in our Western culture. And there are so many things we take for granted about how the world works, about how the mind works, about how the emotions work, about how the bodies work, that we don't even really grasp in their entirety. And being passive to a totally foreign way of presenting understanding about the world Many of the folks on this call may understand what transformation is or the direction of transformation. But the encounter with these non overlapping perspectives and traditions is very familiar to me in the fourth way because the mechanicality of normal human life and activity, as people understand in the West, is the subject matter of the fourth way. And when we have to confront the manifestations of a wholly different universe, really, that's both challenging, sometimes exciting, but decidedly useful in this project of self-examination that is central to the fourth way and, in my view, spiritual practice in, in general, but maybe not, depending on how some of these traditions configure what that means. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to go a little deeper on uh, something that you said. So Rob was talking about self-examination and the importance of that as a precursor to entering into a different tradition, an indigenous tradition that one may not have the cultural context or they have been raised within. So this is an interesting question. 
the fourth way in the Gurdjieff work and its emphasis starts with the premise that in our ordinary states of consciousness, we as human beings largely spend our time in a state of waking sleep. So waking sleep means that our life is mediated through our conceptions, our perceptions, the chords being played by sensation, emotion, and thought. Each of these things we build a world with, actually a world is given to us more typically in our upbringing. And we inhabit that world and the constructs in our field of consciousness are the things that we take to be real. And so we build a world that way. And we have programming from our culture, programming from our family, programming that we voluntarily inject within ourselves by the things that we encounter and the experiences we have. But we live in this mediated existence in which we put most of our attention on our thoughts and feelings about things and not necessarily hold a space for being touched by the universe as it is. In the fourth way, there's a term used, identification. In that waking sleep, we were identified with the contents of the dream. And so the fourth way practice, the ideas, the practices of self-observation and self-remembering, many of the different exercises that Gurdjieff taught and many of the exercises that have come since him are focused on bringing our attention back to observing how we behave as organisms as we are. We begin to observe our thoughts and our feelings and our sensations and our bodies from a place of seniority or a place where we are beyond that. And at the beginning of that kind of practice, we might get fleeting glimpses that this is what's going on. But ultimately, in the tradition, the intent is to begin to see more and more clearly the degree to which we live most of the contents of our lives in this identified mechanical way. And ultimately, in that scene, there's an opening and other possibilities become available. One of the possibilities that becomes available is being able to live to a larger degree in a kind of equanimity or a spaciousness that is not always being buffeted by the internal contents of our psychological structure. And so if we can get to that place even in moments or even somewhat more reliably as practice continues, we're able to hold a place and at least be aware when our psychological programming asserts itself and wants to take control of the situation or take control of what our experience is. And I'm saying all this because if we're not raised in a culture, like I'll use the example of the practice that I've been involved in, a West African divinatory practice, It's Dagra spiritual practice or divinatory practice. If you're not raised in that culture, then as a Westerner approaching it, it's hard not to have some, I don't know, some interference pattern formed in your relationship because of your own cultural matrix. We may project on things. We may assume we know things. We may understand concepts and words in a particular way. But as long as we are doing that kind of asserting and we're not even aware that we're doing it, then something else is happening than the pure content of that particular tradition. So if you can attain to equanimity that allows for putting some of that interference pattern aside or allowing that to be subdued, then it's possible to be open, completely open to whatever this tradition has and whatever forces or energy and energetic matrix this tradition has and allow it to touch you. And that's what our friend that Rob was quoting this morning was meaning when he said that in order to really enter into a indigenous practice, but the same is true for a practice for which we are not tuned culturally, one has to enter into it passively. And passive doesn't mean like you're a rug. Passive means that the active part of you is actually actively stepping back from the identifications that arise when your programming sees something it doesn't understand. And so we have to be actively passive. 
if you will, we're not doing something, we're undoing something in this process. And by undoing, we can allow ourselves to be open and be penetrated by another tradition. Any questions at this point? Well, why would you do that if you are bonded to a particular tradition which you feel has what is needed for you? I can only speak for myself. And that is that I came to realize or seem to understand that there was more in heaven and earth ratio than was dreamt of in my philosophy, by which I mean that a tradition is the foundation and the universe is always changing. That's one of the things the Buddhists have very clearly established, at least in my view. Everything is always changing. And when I began to do things like the Conscious Family Festival, which some of you may remember, I came into contact with folks from a number of different traditions, including this Homo Native Californian tradition. And I came to see that if I projected my fourth way informed views onto what that tradition would assert, there was a mismatch. Furthermore, I came to see that I could really expand areas of my own constitution, heart in particular, and body appreciation in particular, that could expose my fourth way habits of training to new information that was absolutely critical for me to continue my own growth. So it's a great question. And it's not as if I've left behind in any way whatsoever, my own deep and enduring foundation. In fact, I experience it as being expanded into, you know, we've just done our 400th mystical positivist show, which are conversations with people from different traditions. And at first, when we first started the show, those very first podcasts, I thought that I didn't have that much to get from those folks. I thought a little little here and there, but I came to realize that what a foolish and niggardly small way of looking at the opportunity I had to tune into the incredible richness of the understanding of these folks who had lived their unique lives, done their unique practices, and were perfectly willing to converse with us about them in ways where we tried mutually to understand each other. So that foundation helped me to move towards these practices that I'm talking about. And as I said, to enrich my own practice, vastly expand my own practice, really, such that I am really happy to be in the space where I can find myself like a little child or baby. If you read just ordinary books about people who go to a totally different country where they don't speak the language at first and they don't understand the cultural practices, People are treated like a baby. And there's a richness in that because the baby can learn without having to process things through the intellect. And that's one of the richnesses that I have found for myself with the particular experiences that I've had. A few years after our teacher had died, and I think we had the bookstore open in the first early years, we came to meet a a guy who's a friend now. And he was a long time, like a 25-year member of the uh, Gurdjieff Foundation. He was so forth way that he actually was doing this look at the time where he was bald and had this big mustache and he really looked like He really did look like Gurdjieff quite a bit. (laughs) But what was interesting was that at some point in his work with the foundation, there came a point where he needed something more. And what he found was the Ifa African divinatory tradition. So he studied that, 
I think he went to Africa and studied with elders there and continued to deepen in that, became a diviner, teaches divination and gives divinations. And at that time, this was quite a while back, I mean, he even did a, a divination for me. I don't know that he did one for you, but he did one with me. And you know, it was interesting to see because it was so unusual. Ultimately, he said that the door was open for me in this tradition. And at the time, it just didn't feel like that was something that I wanted to do because we're really still formulating and working with the new phase of work with Tayu in the, in the wake of our teacher's death a number of years before. So I didn't say yes at that time to an invitation. So now fast forward more recently, Rob mentioned this event called the Festival of Conscious Parenting or the Conscious Family Festival. It had a couple of incarnations, but one of the participants was a friend of ours who has, besides working within her own sort of familial tradition of the Strega tradition of Italian wise women, she also trained in a Dagra divinatory tradition. And we had a silent auction as part of the fundraising for this. And one of the things she donated was a divination. And no one bought the divination. So uh, at the end of the uh, auction, Rob and I thought, why not? Let's, let's do this. So we, we together did a divination with our friends. Taking turns. Yeah. And the way the divination works and the way the divinatory practice works is that the diviner has a relationship with entities that in that tradition are called wetame. They can be thought of as earth elementals, elementals of the wild, they can be thought of angels. There's a lot of ways of mapping them, but they're intelligences that basically mediate or provide information for the diviner than to relate to people receiving the divination or the person receiving the divination. And in that practice, typically what's prescribed are rituals. And so this is a very ritual-centric kind of practice. And the rituals can be simple. They can be like pouring water on a tree. They can be more complex. There's things called soul washings. There's bathing in milk. There's all sorts of things, burying eggs. There's a whole sort of ritual language that's associated with this. But for Rob and me, we were given... We were each given things to do. Yeah. And one of the things that we decided to do to enact these rituals was we were going on a trip up to the Sierra Nevada mountains in California here, actually right at the Nevada border. So we decided, well, we'll enact these traditions because they were meant to be outside. Okay. The rituals were supposed to be done outside, so we would do it up there as part right. of our trip. We drove up, and then we realized we'd forgotten to get some of the items. One of the items was birdseed. There were several other items that we'd forgotten. Also, so we go off to a large supermarket a nearby town just across the border in Nevada. We walk in the door and an employee of the store comes up to us and said, did you remember the bird seed? My uh, eyes open, my tongue lolls on the ground. I'm like, what the heck just happened? Yeah. And there was another item that I don't recall at the moment that she also directed us to in this store. So we, we went and got the items and some other things that we needed for dinner, I guess. And then she would, en ended up being our checker. And I'm like trying to ascertain if she knew things that I didn't imagine she could know. And there was no evidence whatsoever of that. I mean, I've never had someone, an employee of a grocery store, ask me if we remembered <laughs> the bird seed. Yeah, so, or anything like that when I came in the store. So that, that got our attention, certainly. Right. That in itself isn't enough to explain my own connection with the tradition. It was very interesting and certainly resonated. But well, there think, were other things yeah. as well. You know, I, I did my ritual at dusk and I was supposed to wait for a response from the universe. And literally the second I completed the ritual, a coyote starts howling. And we never heard a coyote again the rest of our stay or had heard a coyote before. I'm not saying that there's necessarily anything to it, but it makes me question, it helps me to question the rigor of the scientific worldview and its power to explain phenomena such as we've just described and other phenomena as well.
There were other divinations probably like a year later. I won't go into the details of that right now, but each time we would do divinations with our friend, something like that would happen. There'd be some kind of juice of a different category. But the interesting thing for me was we did a divination with our friend. It had been a while. So she's having an argument with the Wedeme. What she said was, they want to claim me for the tradition. So in that tradition, you can't just say, I'm going to be a diviner. You have to be claimed. The Wedeme will say, we want to work with this person. Then it becomes a very different process. And that process ultimately not concludes, but there's a major step in a process called merging. But basically, I was asked. I was asked point blank. And at that moment for me, it just seemed like uh, I had a yes. So it wasn't like I was trying to fill something that wasn't filled in my tradition. I was simply invited to do something. And so I said yes. And that's partly the sense of going with something or moving with something that's sort of uh, moving towards you. It doesn't at all mean that I'm giving up anything, as Rob said. And in fact, our friend says that for her, you know, her specialty as a diviner is connecting people with their lineages. So there may be familial lineages or different kinds of lineages that one may have a connection to that may or may not be out of the Dogra tradition. In this sense, then, there's nothing to give up. And there's nothing that was really incomplete so much as I was invited and the feeling was to say yes and to move with that. And so I'm saying that because it didn't arise out of me saying, hey, this is something I want to do. In fact, it wasn't something I expected I wanted to do. It's just something that arose and I've continued to move with it. But it's a very different modality than the fourth way modality. There's a lot of shrine making and the shrines have to be made with figures that are made from clay that you have to source yourself. It's messy, it's dirty, and yet it's very connected to nature. And for me, what I find very enriching about it is that it's pulling me out into nature. Rob doesn't need this because he gardens all the time. But for me, it's pulling me into a natural space in a way that I really didn't have a relationship with. For myself, in terms of getting involved with the uh, Northern California Pomo dear friend that we developed through the Conscious Family Festival, actually, she invited us to a Grandmother Ocean workshop. And I'm like, well, I don't know. That doesn't sound like something I'd normally do. But the trust I'd come to develop in her manifestation. And I later came to realize that she had done an incredible amount of work. She had many and continues to have many, many challenges just at the ordinary level of living. But she has also demonstrated a kind of open heartedness that most people with those challenges would not have been able to do. So I'm really glad that I've pursued that. And it's now started to open me up to stuff I completely, that was kind of poisoned for me. So she has helped me open up to stuff. I have found it to be uh, quite helpful. And once again, it offered a perspective I don't think I would have ever accessed. So I guess if there's a theme here, it seems as if we're looking at a very personal kind of personal doors opening with persons. And I suspect that there may be something true about that, not just only with indigenous traditions. Certainly my relationship with uh, Robert Ennis, my teacher, was opened through personal. I wasn't looking for a teacher when I met him. And yet I was magnetically entrained in a way that um, I could not gainsay. So it's interesting that it's these personal things, two persons, that can be doors, at least for me. Now, other people may be different. And the irony is, as I started off saying earlier, that the fourth way has this incredible, elaborated worldview. It's a thing of beauty, really, if you really explore it. Because Gurdjieff was explaining processes of the universe, processes of how human bodies, minds, hearts work, processes of the way planets interact with 
each other and with stars and galaxies, etc. All these incredibly elaborated processes. And it also, for me, has been fed by who I meet and what they invite me to do. And I'm, I'm not going to say no to that. So that was like a 25-minute answer, I think, to your question. <laughs> Maybe we should pause for other questions. I have a comment slash question, I suppose. In a lot of ways, of the system is very focused on this kind of Western civilization problem. We have very specific problems. You pointed to scientism and everything we got with it. And so, so much of the way the machinery is set up is kind of very pointed towards addressing that. And that's what I found very attractive about the system and still find very attractive about the system because it's so trying to get at that thing. You know, the center of gravity is to crack that nut. Um, and there's so much more beyond that. And almost like, why would you try to almost containerize that into the tradition when you have life itself to be open to? And then as part of that, it's not what I'm hearing is like the mystical aspects of life are wholly embodied, represented by these traditions and just another way of stepping into life beyond the scientism. Yes, the nut that I was trying to crack was the peculiar personalities that were forming in people as a result of the scientific worldview, the colonial worldview, the Western civilization worldview. And what I found, you know, you have to dig a little deeper, I think, in the fourth way tradition to find that the mystical aspects, and it's there, it really is there, but you have to both know where to look and how to look, uh, because a lot of the focus is, is on the primary problem of identification, our egoism, our vanity, the personality that drives our relationship to life. Just actually this morning, as we were talking with this group of senior fourth way practitioners, one of the gentlemen who has had a lot of experience with foundation groups, the Gurdjieff Foundation groups, has commented that he sees a lot of people who spend 30 years really trying to fix themselves. They construe what they're doing as trying to fix themselves, as opposed to coming to an understanding that there's nothing to fix and that it's the relationship to that thing that you think you need to fix that actually is, is the thing to release. You know, there's quite a difference between someone who's earnestly going to their group meetings and beating themselves up every time they uh, make a mistake versus someone who sort of gets beyond that and is more at this place of surrendering to something higher. And one of Gurdjieff's primary students who uh, led the Gurdjieff Foundation for many years, Madame de Salzman, would write in later years about bringing higher energy down, bringing this energy in. And the focus was on something that really, to me, has a lot more a resonance with things I've experienced and practiced in the Western magical tradition. And actually, interestingly enough, I find the same patterning coming up in the uh, Dagra work that I've been doing. The focus is really about being of service in this particular phenomenal realm by bringing higher energy down and helping to support or counter an energetic configuration that's uh, out of balance in a lot of ways. But a lot of times people get stuck in this place of trying to fix themselves because when one begins to look at the imperfection of our psychological organism, it's very easy to get frustrated and want to be in control. But it's that wanting to be in control that's the very thing that is driving the machine. And so letting that go allows some other possibilities to take place. I just want to add, it's parenthetical to this question, but there was a book published just a couple of years ago, maybe by a guy in Australia named Robert Azizi, which makes a point of collecting a bunch of very little known Gurdjieff practices, which seem to, in many cases, originate in the Christian mystical traditions that Gurdjieff was surely familiar with from his background. So the fact that it's taken 80 years or 70 years or something like that for that stuff to be published and to become better known is interesting, but it's changing the fourth way itself. The book, I believe, is called Gurdjieff's uh, Transformational Contemplations. And the uh, author's father is easy. It's a, a Marianite priest. Uh, but he was a student of a fourth way group leader who had worked directly with Gurdjieff. It is interesting because one of the 
centerpieces of the practices that he identifies that Gurdjieff was teaching later in his teaching career was things very similar to and sometimes identical to the prayer of the heart, which is where you say, Lord, have mercy upon me in the simplest form. So these were prayers and these are contemplations about asking for help and asking for an opening at the heart level. The language around that seems completely different than observe yourself. It is because those better known aspects of the Gurdjieff tradition were ones that needed to be applied by this high class intelligentsia audience that Gurdjieff was speaking to in the early part of the 20th century. You know, and then in the Gurdjieff language, applying the practice or observing oneself or bringing the intention to observe oneself can be thought of as what they call the first conscious shock, but actually opening yourself and receiving something beyond yourself is what completes the octave, and that's the second conscious shock, and that's the higher transformation or the transformation of the heart. So even the fourth way is changing in ways. Who knows what the future will bring? Gurdjieff himself said that the way that he taught publicly would fall apart within a couple of generations, and by the third generation would no longer serve. In fact, Recently, we had a, one of our mystical positivist conversations with one of the remaining high-level Gurdjieff movement teachers. And it was a wonderful conversation, but what she lamented was that the transmission was not happening anymore. She wasn't able, or people weren't tuning into, or whatever it was, so things are changing for the Gurdjieff movement as well. Yeah, it's a, it was a little, a little bit like yoga in the West. People mistake the form for the interior work. Right. That's right. Well, there's two things that come to mind that I'd like to mention and, and see if you have any comments about them. One is you've been speaking about the value of being open, specifically of being open to other traditions. And I've just found tremendous value in that. And also, there are some who really have the perspective that there shouldn't be mixing. Mm -hmm. Because there's one lineage or tradition that will take you where you need to go. And if you start spending your energy with other ways, then it's less likely that you're going to be able to follow your path to the end. I wonder if you'd have something to say about that. And then the second thing that's really striking me from what you're saying is that you're talking about other people, if I'm understanding this, being a doorway of connecting to a process with someone unexpectedly who you come upon, who you make a connection with, and who has something to offer you. You feel that. Maybe they have some mastery. Maybe they're further along in some way, or they just have something that could be food for you. Do you think that it's irreplaceable on the path, the need to connect with other human beings or another human being who can bring you further along? These days, so many people are on their own path, it seems, and may have some connection with a path, but not that kind of a relationship that I'm hearing you guys talk about. So you want me to take the first question? You want to take the second? Yeah, I'll go for it. Let me just interject for it. It doesn't have to be a person, by the way. That's one of the things that I've come to see, that other living beings, for example, can inform. And I've heard authentic sounding stories from people whose testimony I trust discussing that sort of thing. The first question you asked is its own thing. So I just wanted to respond to that because I didn't want that to get lost because it's an important uh, piece here. So there's a value in being open to other traditions, for sure. And there's value in being deep within a single tradition. So what are we talking about here? Well, first of all, the DNA of our school, like the DNA of the school of many of yours, has been to be open to other traditions. Our teacher met the teacher of many of you by virtue of Dharma teachers wanting to make friends and have conversation. It's in our DNA 
in our school's DNA. It's in our store's DNA. In our store's DNA and on our radio show's DNA to have these conversations and to be able to be open to other traditions and let ourselves be touched by those traditions. So for us, I'd say that just even while we were practicing with our teacher, that we were certainly penetrated by Buddhism quite a bit just because of some of the relationships we had and people we knew. But still, there's a period of time where it's important to go deep with a teaching and get to a point where one can move and start to explore other things, but there needs to be a foundation. And I say this, I'm observing, for instance, even as I embark in a community of people who are diviners and associated with my mentor in the dogro tradition, it's very interesting. I have to sort of set aside preconceptions and things like that. And yet I still can appreciate the value of the training that I have as a foundation to approach this work because There's a bunch of stuff I don't have to go through in that tradition in order to start to function in a certain way in that tradition. I don't mean to put errors on that. It's just that there's a certain kind of work you have to go through in any tradition to sort out and harmonize the being and the organism. There's lots of different ways of doing that. The fourth way has a way of doing that. Even in the Dogra tradition, my mentor told me, you know, when I first made my first shrine, which is sort of like the kickoff for this line of training. She said that I could expect to be given lots of rituals. It's very common for people that they're like on overdrive having to do a bunch of this stuff. And those rituals are all about working out and healing and balancing energetic manifestations in one's psychic space. And in my case, I didn't have so much. You know, the message I was getting was, cool it. You don't have to be the best student here. I was sort of, in a sense, being held back which was exactly what I needed to be in relationship with this tradition because my habitual tendency is to launch into something and to try to climb to the top. And in this case, I was definitely not being allowed to do that. And that's what I needed, but it was a whole different sort of thing. And I attribute part of that to, besides being pushed back on something that was my own kind of mechanicality, there's other stuff that I don't have to deal with because I dealt with it in the foundational work that I did in my root tradition. And honestly, if you look at other traditions, Eastern traditions, there's a notion, I think, in the Vedic traditions of a root guru, and then you can have other teachers, and those teachers may be quite different. And I think in Buddhism, you know, you'll have your teacher, but then you might go to other teachers to learn different things. And so I think that template and the propriety and integrity you have to have to do that is the same. It's just that we live in a world where we have such a mishmash of different traditions coming together. It's actually, it's crazy wonderful in a way. I mean, it's like every spiritual tradition on the planet you can have some access to, and you can actually have access now to people who know something about the transmission of that tradition. But it still boils down to the same thing. You have a root tradition, and that root has to be deep enough to provide you with a certain kind of sustenance from the depth so that then you can branch out and allow a natural growth process to take place, which is just a reflection of who you are. So um, I want to come back to this aspect of the personal connection, the heart-to-heart transmission, because that to me is where, where the juice flows. And one of the things I haven't mentioned yet that I've gotten from actually both the divinations with the Dagra, but also from my interaction with our dear Pomo friend is a reinvigoration, perhaps, of my relationship with my teacher now deceased 24 years. I grew up thinking, you're dead, you're dead. (laughs) there might be some kind of amorphous voodoo that could happen with the dead being, someone who had been in a human body. And now I am not skeptical in the way that I used to be. I just don't know how it's supposed to manifest for people in different situations, people in different traditions, but I keep getting confirmation that my teacher and I ain't done. We are co-creating as we speak, actually, (laughs) right? 
And it is a deepening of that relationship and an exploration for me of what that will continue to develop in meaning for myself. And the way that has arisen for me is that these friends with whom I have had a deep connection that we've tried to describe have created a way for me to trust the heart connection that was always present, but that my skeptical Western mind wanted to deny. So that's been a pretty cool thing. It's not voodoo. It's something that helps me direct my own practice, actually, and has seemed at least to me to deepen it. I mean, I could be fooling myself. I'm always looking. That's definitely what I got from the fourth way. There's never a seat with the laurel wreath on it waiting for me to to, uh, let go of striving. But for things that I used to dismiss, I have an open mind and I have an open heart. And I even have, I think, more and more, this is the hardest part, a body that can allow that connection to become more vibrant. At least I hope so. It has been doing that. The other questions. Yeah. We've got a few minutes left here. And a couple of things are coming to mind. The first thing is that what you're talking about with not being a spiritual smorgasbord, I think you're talking about a level of spiritual maturity. Thomas Merton was years until he actually opened up and traveled and wanted to go to Tibet. I'm thinking also how much it's tied into the fact that, you know, think of generations past and how limited would have been their scope they would ever have come in contact with but what we have now is such a rich possibility of encountering people from so many different traditions so i'm celebrating that and at the same time i'm recognizing that this whole thing about maturity is something that we need to keep in mind something in what you just said reminds me that this is a time when it's possible to connect at whatever level of depth Uh, with many traditions in a way that was not true, I don't know, very much a hundred years ago or hundreds of years ago. But I think there's something in particular about this indigeneity aspect to this. I don't remember hearing about when I was young in practice, young in the world of our tradition in my 20s, I don't remember hearing about people so much authentically connecting with Native traditions. Actually, one of the earliest conversations we had on The Mystical Positivist was with a guy honoring the medicine, was his book. Yes, Ken Cohen. And he was deeply implicated in the Chinese medicine, but became is one of the First Nations in Canada really connected. And that was his book, Honoring the Medicine. And that was the first time I'd heard of a a nice Jewish boy connecting with something like a native tradition. But there are people who are doing this. There are people who are authentically connecting. I'll just conclude by noting that this time I'm seeing much more connection with those people who have been through the effects of colonialism have been marginalized culturally. And that is changing. And that is a terribly welcome development. There was a book that came out maybe five or six years ago, won awards. The title, I think, is American Genocide. And it's about the incredible destruction of Native Californians. It's just so hard to read page after page of the detail that he gives. But I guess we had to come to this point where that kind of knowledge is becoming recognized widely for, I think, folks to feel like these are more widespread wisdom paths that can be um, accessed and shared. 
by people who are willing to do the work, who are willing to be passive to those active traditions that remain. And by people who have the wisdom and experience and matrix to recognize the sign of the times and how crucial it is at this point. And it has been for a very long time for us to listen to indigenous people, but it's the last hour in so many ways now. But I wanted to just comment on your whole talk. What an important conversation and consideration it is. And just the question about whether to stay with one tradition or branch out to others. In my experience, like true path really brings us to the universal. And that's what I hear in what you're speaking about. And in the guru tradition, at some point, really understand what the guru function is, that it becomes everything, including the person in the grocery store who says, did you remember the bird seed? So to me, it's like an opening up to the universal and this thing about timing, that so much of it has to do with timing for us individually on the path, timing for us individually, what we're ready for, what we can handle. And then there's the bigger timing of what you're bringing about the importance of indigenous wisdoms. One friend was a person who was born in the Congo, raised in the Congo. We had a meeting and I described what I was putting out in the world. He just took point blank. This is for you Westerners. <laughs> so, you know, we don't have these problems. It's, it's interesting as I read some of the literature from the Dagra tradition, one of the famous Dagra writers, Maladoma Some, some of you may have read, has written a number of books on the tradition and on the work of ritual. And it's not like people don't have problems and don't have life issues they have to deal with, but they have a very different family unit and structure to address those things. And it's just very different from ours. We're way more alienated in the West and more isolated and more individuated. And we don't have the same kind of energetic support mechanisms that those communities have. People are raised in ritual. So ritual has this incredible potency and power. It's like mother's milk for people raised in those communities. So when we come into a tradition like that with our Western kind of headset, it's an interesting mix. And I'm grateful for the fourth way for providing the tools to get behind the Western headset because it's a pretty precise set of tools for dealing with that and creating the maturity to allow me to go into a different place and to partake of a very different context. But I'm also, you know, I guess as I, as I consider it, we as a people are changing even in the West now. As crazy as it all seems right now and as uh, insane as everyone seems to be, there's possibilities for genuine arising of a creative response to the reality of our situation on this planet. And in that sense, I think I can be very hopeful about the changes that we're seeing even in the uh, Western mind. And who knows where that's going to go? It's not necessarily all craziness. There could be some really upwelling of creative energy. On this topic of ritual, in my youth, there were wonderful things about Catholic ritual that I deeply appreciated. And then I had to let go of it for whatever mechanical or, or other reasons. But I'm reconnecting with the principle and practice of ritual as a tool that can be useful. It does entrain possibilities that are beyond what the scientistic and scientism views would permit. So I guess that's where we have to uh, end it, it looks like, time-wise. But thank you for your attention and your comments. I deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much.